Dietary intake of cholesterol. What's optimal? So first, let's have a look at some epidemiological studies. So here we can see heart disease mortality risk plotted on the y-axis against dietary cholesterol intake on the x-axis. And this was a study of about 37,000 people that had an average age of about 50 years with an eight-year follow-up. So when compared with the dotted line, when the shaded gray region is either completely above that or completely below that, we have st a statistical significance. So when compared with the referent, which was defined as a bit below 200 milligrams of uh, dietary cholesterol per day, we can see that relatively higher values and also relatively lower values were not statistically associated with heart disease mortality risk. So does that mean I can eat as much cholesterol as I want? Let's have a look at some more, more studies. So in a, in a similarly sized study, this, in this case, about 30,000 subjects, pretty close to about the same age, 52 years old in this study, but had a longer follow-up, uh, 18 years, uh, they looked at the incidence of CVD, cardiovascular disease, which was defined as fatal and non-fatal coronary heart disease, stroke, heart failure, and cardiovascular deaths from other causes. And then they divided their data into five quintiles. So zero to 114 milligrams of cholesterol per, per day, 114 to 174, quintile two, 175 to 229, quintile three, 230 to 300, uh, quintile four, and then greater than 300, quintile five. So when compared with the reference, which in this case was defined as low cholesterol, so less than 114 milligrams per day, we can see that quintile two and quintile three were not significantly different, which suggests that cholesterol in, dietary cholesterol intakes uh, from 114 to 229 milligrams per day are not significantly different in terms of the incidence of CVD-related outcomes when compared with lower intake, so less than 1, 114 milligrams per day. In contrast, now we see a statistical significance. You can see those confidence intervals are at one or higher for both quintile, quintile four and quintile five. So more than 230 milligrams of dietary cholesterol per day is associated with a higher risk for incident CVD when compared with relatively lower cholesterol intakes, so less than 114 milligrams per day. So which now we have two studies with somewhat contrasting data. In one study, we have dietary cholesterol is not significantly associated with heart disease mortality risk. And in the second study, we have more than 230 is associated with a higher risk for incident CVD related outcomes. So which study is closer, closer to the truth? So heart disease mortality risk is only one outcome. What about the association for all cause mortality risk, which includes death from all causes with dietary cholesterol intake? So I'm gonna look at that data from these same two studies. So first, when looking at the SIA study, uh, now we're looking at all cause mortality risk plotted against dietary intake of cholesterol on the X. And now we can see with the p-values, we have statistical significance. So uh, when dietary cholesterol intake was 235 milligrams per day, that was associated with the lowest all-cause mortality risk. Uh, an increased, all, significantly increased all-cause mortality risk was associated with dietary cholesterol intakes that were less than 184 milligrams per day. And then higher values, so higher than 235, uh, so dietary cholesterol intakes that were higher than 235 milligrams per day were not significantly associated with an uh, increased all-cause mortality risk or with any uh, uh, effect on all-cause mortality risk. So are these findings con consistent with other studies? So let's have a look at the Zhang study. So again, we're looking at all-cause mortality risk. Model 1 is the least adjusted model. Model 2 has uh, more variables that were adjusted for, and Model 3 is the fully adjusted model. And, we, and again, we have these five quintiles of dietary cholesterol intake. So when compared with that referent, which was uh, 0 to 114 milligrams per day of dietary cholesterol, again, we see that relatively low intakes are not associated with an increased all-cause mortality risk. And then although we see model 1 for 230 to 300 milligrams per day for dietary cholesterol intake is significantly associated with an increased all-cause mortality risk, we can see that when further variables are included, uh, or adjusted for, so model 2 and model 3, that statistically, statistical significance is lost. But now we see in quintile 5, in each of the models, so the model 1, 2, and 3, we have uh, that dietary cholesterol intakes, uh, 301 to 453 milligrams per day, are associated with an increased all-cause mortality risk when compared with the lower intake, so less than 114 milligrams per day. So now we have contradictory findings. In one study, we have less than 184 milligrams per day of dietary cholesterol is associated with an increased all-cause mortality risk, and in contrast, uh, relatively lower uh, in the other study, relatively lower intakes of cholesterol were not associated with an increased all-cause mortality risk. Similarly, in the CS study, we have relatively higher cholesterol intakes, dietary cholesterol intakes, are not associated with an increased all-cause mortality risk. But then in the Zhang study, we have somewhat opposite data where 
uh, cholesterol intakes greater than 300 milligrams per day are significantly associated with an increased all-cause mortality risk. So how can we get closer to the truth here? So to evaluate whether relatively low or relatively higher intakes for dietary cholesterol uh, are optimal, I can investigate correlations for dietary cholesterol with big picture biomarkers. In other words, we can now change this title into epidemiological studies versus my own N of one data. And we can then try to evaluate what's optimal in terms of uh, a dietary cholesterol intake based on my own data. So to get there, it's important that I go through a relatively quick review. Uh, so I've been tracking my daily diet since 2015. So what does that mean? So I've weighed literally all of my food uh, using a food scale. And then those food amounts are entered into a chronometer and uh, I'm not sponsored by them. So any uh, online software, you know, MyFitnessPal or there may be others uh, will basically, you know, do the similar job. And then that output data from chronometer is uh, entered. I enter it uh, and that data includes macro and micronutrients and the individual food amounts. I enter that into a spreadsheet every day. It only takes me about five minutes a day. It's not that time consuming. All right, so then the average dietary intake for the time in between blood tests then corresponds to the next blood test. So what that means is if I blood test on day one and blood test on day 60, for the 59 day period in between blood tests, the average dietary intake for that period then corresponds to the blood test on day 60. So with enough blood tests and with enough corresponding uh, dietary data for each blood test, I can then look for correlations between my diet with the blood test variables and see, try to see what's optimal. So that's what, the, what I've, I've stated here. So then I investigate correlations between the blood biomarkers with diet. So let's take a quick look at my average daily cholesterol intake. And this is since I started tracking in April of 2015, all the way up until uh, yesterday, so uh, October 8th. Um, and so I have 32 blood tests during that six and a half year period. And each blue dot corresponds to my average, di di average daily dietary cholesterol intake that corresponds to a blood test. So my range is somewhat wide and that's good uh, you know, because we can evaluate you know, uh, the effect of relatively lower amounts or somewhat higher amounts on the big picture biomarkers, as I'll go over in a second. And then my average dietary cholesterol intake during this time has been 143 milligrams per day. So within my own data, uh, is dietary cholesterol significantly associated with these quote unquote big picture biomarkers? So what are the big picture biomarkers? So I've delineated them here. There are 23 markers that I regularly track and I blood test uh, six times a year or potentially more if I decide to go more often. Uh, so let's just go through what they include. So I've got glucose and homocysteine grouped together, but I probably won't group them together uh, in a future video, but uh, homocysteine can pretty much go in its own category. So they include glucose as a marker of insulin resistance slash sensitivity, three markers of kidney function, creatinine, uric acid, and blood urea nitrogen, bun, four markers of liver function, uh, lipoproteins, uh, immune cells, red blood cell related markers, inflammation, including high sensitivity C-reactive protein, and then the overall biological age score as computed by Levine's PhenoAge and aging.ai. So note that with the exception of homocysteine, lipoprotein A, and C-reactive protein, these biomarkers are found on the standard chemistry panel plus CBC, which is a less than $35 test. So it's relatively affordable to uh, assess multiple organ systems. Now, so correlations for average daily cholesterol intake with these big picture biomarkers, what do we see? So uh, we can see that the higher my dietary intake of cholesterol, that's correlated with a higher glucose. And as we all know, higher glucose is potentially bad for aging. So that's, I've indicated that by a red arrow going in the wrong direction. Similarly, going in the wrong direction are higher levels of creatinine and blood urine nitrogen. Um, and if anybody's curious for uh, how I'm determining what's optimal in terms of going in which direction or not, I have many videos and uh, articles on my own website uh, that uh, uh, delineate what's optimal for most of these biomarkers. So creatinine and bun, higher levels of that are correlated with higher intakes of dietary cholesterol in my own data. And I should mention the number of blood tests is indicated by the little n next to each biomarker. Uh, all right, so then also going in the wrong direction are neutrophils, which increase during aging, and the percentage of lymphocytes, which decline during aging. So uh, in sum, we've got a higher average dietary cholesterol intake is significantly correlated with five biomarkers going in the wrong direction. What about biomarkers pot potentially going in the right direction? Well, uh, levels of AST and ALT, uh, relatively higher levels of that are going in the wrong direction. So we can see that having a relatively higher dietary cholesterol intake is correlated with lower levels of these liver enzymes. So I've got them indicated by green going in the right direction. Also going in the right direction are platelets. Platelets increase during, uh, sorry, platelets decrease during aging. So uh, that this is a positive correlation would potentially uh, uh, slow that down um, 
to have them going you know, in, in a direction opposite from aging. And then also going in the right direction are red blood cells, which also decline during aging. So a higher intake of dietary cholesterol is significantly correlated with higher levels of red blood cells. So in sum, we've got uh, correlations, significant correlations for a higher average daily cholesterol intake with four bio biomarkers going in the right direction. Now, what I haven't indicated here is also LDL, which there's a significant positive correlation there. So is higher or lower LDL optimal for health? And my average LDL since uh, April of 2015, over 32 blood tests, is 89 milligrams per deciliter, which based on the epidemiological studies, and I'll link to that video in the right corner, uh, would put me at an increased all-cause mortality risk. So if relatively low LDL is bad for health, in my case, I can't say if this would be true for others, we'd expect to see this reflected in the data for this, the big picture biomarkers. So let's have a look at the correlations for LDL with my big picture biomarkers to see if relatively higher amounts or lower amounts may be optimal. So in terms of correlations for LDL with the big picture biomarkers, we can see that it's significantly correlated with five biomarkers going in the wrong direction. So glucose, creatinine, blood urea nitrogen, neutrophils, and the percentage of lymphocytes, but also four going in the right direction. Now we see a significant uh, correlation for LDL with lower homocysteine, lower uh, liver enzymes, AST and ALT, and also higher red blood cells. And note that this pattern is very similar to the uh, one on the previous slide for dietary cholesterol with the big picture biomarkers, but yet it's LDL. So uh, the net score, five going in the, right direct, uh, in the wrong direction and four going in the right direction, that net score between the two is minus one, which suggests that a relatively lower LDL in my case, again, and correspondingly lower dietary cholesterol may be optimal. So going back to the correlations for the dietary cholesterol with the big picture biomarkers, now we can see that uh, I put a red arrow next to LDL as somewhat a little bit below my uh, uh, average for the past six, six and a half years, maybe optimal for LDL. So just to sum that up, now we've got six biomarkers going in the wrong direction for its correlation with dietary cholesterol intake, four going in the, in the right direction, and that net score is minus two. So this suggests, again, as I mentioned for LDL, that a dietary cholesterol intake that is a bit below my six and a half year average, but not my lowest. So if that net score was minus four, minus three, minus five, I would shoot for my lowest intake for di dietary cholesterol. Similarly, if it was zero, if I had an equal amount of biomarkers going in the right and the wrong direction, I would shoot for my average dietary cholesterol intake. And if I had a net score of say plus two, plus one, plus three, something positive, I would shoot for higher dietary cholesterol intakes. That's what the biomarkers would suggest. So going back to my data for dietary cholesterol intake, when considering that my average was, is 143 milligram, milligrams per day, and its correlation with the big picture, big picture biomarkers is, is minus two, that suggests that I should shoot for somewhere a little bit below my average, somewhere around 100 milligrams per day. Now, whether this will be uh, truly optimal, I'll be able to reevaluate this with more data, with more blood tests, with more tracking of my diet, and we'll see if somewhere in the 100 to 143 range or somewhere a little bit lower than 100 milligrams per day will be optimal. All right, that's all for now. Uh, if you made it to the end, thanks for watching. And if you're interested in more data, come check us out on Patreon. You can see all of my attempts to biohack aging. See you in the next video. Have a great day.